welcome um, the man who does not need any introduction because we are lucky to be in his town. So may I have so? I'm getting quite good at uh, making mics taller. All right, just wanted to point that out. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to Keene's Juneteenth celebration. I have a proclamation, actually the second one that uh, has been read in Keene, and I'm going to read it in a couple minutes, but I wanted to make sure that I pointed out these events don't just happen on their own. So the Human Rights Committee has done an excellent job of pulling this together today, pulling together the talent, the singing talent, the speaking talent, all of this. It takes a lot of work, and I want to give a round of applause to the organizers of this event today. Thank you very much. I also want to point out, over the last year, we had a committee here in Keene, the Racial Justice and Community Safety Committee. They did some unbelievable work laying the ground for our future. And I'm going to leave it at that. If you want some more information, go to the city's website, look at the beautiful report that they put together for us. You can find it there, read through it, contemplate it, think about it. And let's give the Racial Justice and Community Safety Committee an applause too. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, I want to just recognize a couple of local restaurants. If you're feeling the Juneteenth spirit and you want to enjoy some amazing food, special dishes that have been put together just for Keene's Juneteenth celebration, yeah, this is where you can go and get them, okay? Listen up. Yazo, Jamaican Grill, right over there. 21. Bar and Grill right at the top of the square, Roxbury Street. Machina Kitchen and Art Bar on Cork Street. And Elm City Brewery. So stop by, patronize those restaurants, taste uh, some of what Keene has to offer. Okay. And without further ado, I'll read the proclamation. Whereas Juneteenth commemorates the day of June 19th, 1865, when enslaved African Americans in Texas were informed by a general of the Union Army that they were free. In accordance with the abolition of slavery as set forth by the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863. And whereas since its first observance in 1866, the anniversary of this event has been celebrated in America's black community as an occasion to recognize the end of 246 years of chattel slavery on this continent. And whereas the state of New Hampshire, as well as 45 other states in the District of Columbia, and recently the federal government of the United States, now officially recognizes Juneteenth as a holiday observance. And whereas recent events in our country, including peaceful protests here in Keene, have underscored the need for our community to do better in recognizing and supporting those among us who are members of minority groups and to work harder to be a more welcoming and inclusive city. And whereas Juneteenth is an opportunity to celebrate African American culture, achievement and freedom, while educating people of all races about how the legacy of slavery continues in our society. Now therefore be it resolved, I, George S. Hansel, mayor of the city of Keene, to hereby proclaim June 19th, 2021, as Juneteenth in the city of Keene recognizing its historic importance, and I encourage all residents to join us in its celebration. In witness whereof, I here and do set my hand in the official seal of the City of Keene, this 19th day of June, 2021. Yeah! Yeah.
I guess, okay, we are on. Um, I was going to say we are very lucky to be here in Keene and to have um, Mayor Hansel uh, supporting uh, such event. And uh, it's official now, so next year uh, we have a holiday, but not just a holiday to be home and just be lazy, but to continue to think about uh, what it means to be, to be free. And it's not just the freedom for us, but uh, for only us, uh, but it's freedom for everyone. Uh, we are not free until we know we are all free. So it's freedom for individuals, it's freedom for families, and freedom for uh, communities. And we have to go beyond, I think, uh, we have to uh, fight for the freedom for the whole world. Uh, and with that, thank you. Uh, with that, I want to uh, welcome um, our next speaker, uh, Pierre Morton. Uh, Pierre is uh, the Chief Diversity Officer. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he's the adjunct professor at Franklin Pierce uh, University, not college. <laughs> uh, Pierre is also a committee member on the uh, City of Keene Racial Justice and Safety Committee, and he serves on the Keene YMCA Juneteenth Task Force. So Pierre, close yours. So glad everyone's here. I was a bit for for clapped, is that the word, uh, back there uh, when I burst out in joy over the mayor's uh, uh, proclamation. But, um, so uh, I had to rewrite everything that I originally wrote like a week ago because of you know recent events. So um, this is coming from my heart. <laughs> so um, is there a way? Right. so it's, I'm a little tall. Awesome. That's perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so today is a day of, of joyous celebration. Uh, and also solemn, I'm sorry, so today is a day of joyous celebration and also solemn commemoration of the final acts of emancipation for the formerly enslaved in Galveston, Texas. It also marks the beginning of the reunification between two nations, the Confederacy of America and the Union. It, is, it, al it also begins the earnest work of bringing into being the equal participation of African Americans within the social political fabric of our nation. This time was and, and still is called Reconstruction. I believe that Reconstruction has never really ended. Historically, Reconstruction started in around June 19, 1865 and ended sometime around 1877. When the segregationists, and in those days, they were called patriots, succeeded in enacting laws that removed the ability to vote for many African Americans. And it also codified the ties between the state and private prisons, or called prisons back then, they were called work camps, or educations, uh, education camps, or they were simply places where the imprisoned would go to build railroad stations. Uh, so they succeeded in enacting those laws that remind us, uh, that, that removed the ability to vote for many African Americans, codified the ties between the state and private prisons that today is called the carceral continuum, carceral continuum, look that up, which is called the school to prison pipeline. I, I know this is dense. So just like today, people of color are overrepresented within the, the system in general. We are stopped, we are frisked, we are imprisoned, and yes, we are even killed uh, at higher proportionate rates than the majority uh, of folks in the United States, of class in the, uh, in the United States. So in 1877, uh, back in 1877, a black or brown person could be accused, just accused, of owing someone money or spitting on the public sidewalk and sent to work on the railroads and other private infrastructure projects 
for years or even decades for just a minor infraction. But, you might say, the past is the past. We're different. We're much more enlightened and we've moved beyond uh, those things and it just doesn't happen today. Ah, on the contrary. The laws and the methods are much more subtle and insidious today than ever before. Today, we are seeing the very same types of laws enacted across the nation that will put poor people and people of color, and those two terms are not synonymous, by the way, in harm's way in relation to the law. For example, decreasing the number of voting places and the time allotted to vote in high populated urban areas while simultaneously making it against the law to provide support or assistance to those waiting in line to vote or arrive to voting places. They're, they're criminalizing that act. That act is a human act of decency. So as we have laws and bills that are going across the country and pushing towards the legislatures. As we begin to criminalize natural human behavior, the result will be the infringement and abridgment of the right to vote. So let us, let us continue this reconstruction, because I believe it's never been over, towards a more perfect union. Now, a more perfect union is enshrined and defined within the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But most of all, this moment should always be a reminder that we must continue to be diligent in protecting our liberty because there is a long, difficult road between the promise of freedom and the actualization of the rights associated with that freedom. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Did y'all hear me? I said there is a long and difficult road between the promise of freedom, which is the law, that's the promise of freedom, and the actual realization, the lived experience of freedom, which are the rights associated with that freedom of being a citizen of the United States. All right, I'll have to publish this. I can see some people. <laughs> I'll publish this later, right? All right, yeah, I'll get that. All right, that's fine. I'm almost done. Then, then let this Juneteenth, 1860, uh, then Juneteenth, 1865, two and a half years after the promise of bodily Freedom, so bodily freedom, because that's all it was promised, was bodily freedom. Remember, they weren't citizens. Oh my God, there's so much we need to talk about. Um, <laughs> a bodily freedom. On, the, on that day, June 18, 1865, 250,000 people finally realized that promise. It took two and a half years for them to finally realize the promise that the law said that you will be bodily free. Two and a half years. It takes a long time between the actual codification of the law that says you can be a citizen of the United States, which that was not what it was saying, but it was saying that you were bodily free. Two and a half years later, 250,000 actually became free. It should never happen again. So today, let's celebrate Juneteenth. And I just want you to remember that freedom isn't free, y'all. Freedom isn't free. It must be diligently looked after, not for one class or individual or group of people, but for each other. Yeah, um, I don't know where to, to start. <laughs> um, as you were talking about uh, the promise of freedom and the act of being free, it just kind of set me back to my own history as uh, a native of Rwanda, a country that went uh, through so much uh, many years ago. And um, I would say I would give whatever it takes to be free and to make sure that my neighbor is free. So if we only take one thing from this, uh, this event today, go home asking yourself, what is my role in, make, in making sure that 
my neighbor, your neighbor, is free. We may think it, we are free, yes, we are free, we are here, we can, you know, talk, sing, dance, eat, you know, travel. But is your neighbor free? Are you providing an environment that makes your neighbor free? So, keep that in mind. As I spent some time uh, learning about our speakers today, um, I got so impressed by a, a, uh, our next speaker, who is a very young young man, um, Jonah Wheeler. Uh, Jonah has been a community leader. Jonah has been working on the Manadnock sh uh, Showing Up for Racial Justice, also known as Surge. Uh, he has been on uh, the steering committee for that um, that committee, uh, the steering committee for that uh, organization, if I could call. And uh, he's on the Manadno uh, Rights and Democracy Chapter Leadership Team. He's a very young man. But let me not spoil his speech because you will see what I mean. So, Jonah, join us. Dr. King talked about long ago in uh, the Hungry People's Forum, people crying for freedom while Congress legislated repression. He talked about how they passed an anti-riot bill rather than a serious poverty program. He knew, he knew better than most that a Congress that proves to be more anti-Negro than anti-rat must be dismissed. What they truly advocate, he said, is socialism for the rich and rugged capitalism for the poor. He saw the triple-pronged sickness within our society of racism, war, and poverty, and knew the only way at that point in history to overturn this system of injustice was to create a solid, unified, and determined thrust to make justice a reality for all Americans. Despite, despite all the opposition the movement faced, despite this, the danger they were in, despite their impending mortality in the face of such danger, they knew the importance of what they were doing. They had the courage to recognize that social movements will never be easy, but are necessary. Dr. King spoke about, spoke about the danger of conceding to incre and incremental change while lacking the soul and commitment to make justice a reality for all men. Forever busy with the expansion of their material wealth, people will not change unless they are pushed into that change. We must collectivize our struggles and the shared fire within our souls to build an unstoppable movement for a morally just world for everyone. Right now, as we stand here, tens of millions of people face evictions or don't have housing. Millions more lack health insurance. Our infrastructure crumbles while our nation aids and abeds apartheid across the world. All of this is pushing us and the nation to the brink of collapse. We have become comfortable with, with a society that imposes evil and hatred on the world without considering one bit the amount of pain required to maintain that comfort. We have become the opposite of what we say we are and the values we espouse. The only solution to this utter failure is to meet the needs of so many, is to use this un unprecedented moment in history to create the thrust necessary to shock the system into change through that collectivized struggle, through a, mo a movement in which you and I take back the power that is owed to us. Those that administer this oppression are scared of one thing, us as a people realizing we have all the power in this nation as we built it, and us, feel like, us finally realizing that, that power and using it to create a nation that we all want to see.
Call me naive, call me a dreamer, call me whatever you wish. I know the courage to do this is there in everyone that has been touched in one way by this greed and hate. Not just because so many, have, so many people have nothing to lose. Not just because our nation is nearing collapse, but because it is the right thing to do. We have a moral obligation to do what is right for our brothers and sisters who are dying and, are, are, and dead as a result of the lives we are living. If you have a platform or a position of power and you're not using it right now to organize a mass movement of people to create the necessary momentum to bring this to a reality, you do not deserve that power. I'm making the plea to anyone listening to this who can do something, to do something. Call for a work stoppage. Make this a moment that shocks the system into change. It's possible if we do it. Our leaders are playing with our lives, gaslighting us into thinking we are, do are, we are thinking things are fine, getting better, etc. And it's time we say, enough is enough. And as Dr. Singh King said, break the moral lag that blinds us to the human realities that, that are around us. Yes, sir. Capitalism was not built on hard work and progress, but on the exploitation of kidnapped peoples and continues to grow off the exploitation of peoples here and abroad. The way to end poverty and end the exploitation of the poor is to provide them with a fair share of the resources. If we don't do that soon, we risk the end of the country we now live in. Thank you all very much. I told you. Jonah, you are not naive, you are not a dreamer, you are an inspiring uh, leader. And I was just thinking, what was I doing when I was 18? So just 18 and uh, he's an inspiring leader. So thank you for your uh, message. I just want to share uh, some words from Nelson Mandela. Uh, he says, uh, he said, uh, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more natural to the human heart than its opposite. So, that's our mission uh, during our time, to, during our journey here on this earth, be to teach love and to love other people. Thank you. Our two next speakers are, um, I call them, the humble, strong community leaders, who are very active in our community, and I want to to challenge you all to make sure that you connect with these two community leaders and um, other speakers uh, we have today, because you will learn more from Juneteenth, but also what it takes to be a community leader. So uh, I'm going to introduce both of them at the same time, but uh, they will uh, talk in a couple of different spots. So the first one is uh, Dr. Dodi. Morris. <laughs> Dr. Mo uh, Dori is an Associate Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Equity at uh, Kinsett College. She's also uh, a member of the Kinsett College President's Cabinet. Dori has been serving on the Keen Human Rights Committee for many years. Uh, I believe I served uh, with Dori back in 2013, and uh, Dori is still on the committee. Um, so we will get to hear from Dori in a little bit. And our next um, uh, speaker will be Councillor Walkman. Uh, Councillor Walkman is our uh, uh, city council in Kim. And uh, yes. <laughs> 
Councillor Walkman is uh, an investigator with the New Hampshire Department of Health and the Human Services Bureau of Elderly and Other Services. Uh, primary uh, Councillor Walkman is, uh, is focusing on increasing services to combat homelessness and subst uh, subst uh, substance misuse, continuing to attract and retain young professionals in the area and ensuring affordable housing option for all residents. So we are so lucky to have this community, uh, these two uh, humble community leaders. So, Councilor Walkman, if you uh, want to join me. Pardon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and happy June. It's so nice to see people out and about and enjoying our beautiful downtown again. Before I get started, I want to extend my thanks to the City of Keene Human Rights Committee, Keene State College, and the Keene Public Library as well as to all the performers and organizers of today's celebration. I thought long and hard on what I wanted to say today and what vibe I wanted to invoke. You likely don't know this about me, but I enjoy learning about history and going to museums. Maybe that is why I was nominated by Mayor Hansel to be a member of the Historic District Commission. I know I'm biased here, but I particularly like New England history. Another lesser known fact about me is that I'm biracial, being of Irish, Cape Verdean, and African American descent, which I feel has given me a heightened awareness and unique perspective into America's past and present race relations. When planning today's events, the committee selected to use the words recognize, celebrate and educate in order to promote the event and guide as and as a guide for planning. With that said, I will recite the Portsmouth pet petition, which was written by 20 New Hampshire slaves in 1779 to declare their freedom. As I mentioned, the Portsmouth petition was written in 1779, three years after the creation of the Declaration of Independence. Historians have determined the petition was written by the creators themselves without influence from their owners. This shows the creators of the petition were educated, knowing how to read and write, were aware of the inequalities they face, and wanting of their freedom. And maybe, most importantly, knew the power of their collective voice. I will be reading the petition as written. The Portsmouth petition reads as follows. State of New Hampshire, to the Honorable Council and House of Representatives of said state, now sitting in Exeter in and for said state. The petition of Nero Brewster, Barrow Rogers, R Romero Ringe, Cato Newmarch, Caesar Garish, Zebolian Gardner, Quam Sherburn, Samuel Wentworth, Will Clarkson, Jack Ordorney, Scipio Hubbard, Seneca Hall, Peter Warner, Cato Warner, Farrow Shores, Windsor Moffat, Garrett Colton, Kiddinge Tuckerman, Peter Forrest, and Whipple, and Prince Whipple, native of Africa, now forcibly detained in slavery in said state, most humbly seeth upon the terms of the most perfect equality with other men. That freedom is, inher is an inherent right of the human species not to be surrendered 
but by consent for the sake of social life. That private and public tyranny and slavery are alike detestable to minds, conscious of the equal dignity of human nature. That in power and authority of individuals derived solely from a principle of coercion against the will of individuals and to depose of their persons and property consists the completest idea of private and public political slavery. That all men being amendable to the deity for the ill improvement of the blessings of his providence. They hold themselves in duty, bound strenuously to exert every faculty of our minds to obtain that blessings of freedoms, which they were are justly entitled to from the donation of the beneficent creator. That through ignorance and brutish violence, their native countrymen, by the sinister of others, who ought to have taught them better. While they, while but children, are incapable of self-defense, whose infancy might have prompted protection, were seized, imprisoned, and transported from their native country, where ignorance and Christianity prevailed. They were born free to a country where through knowledge, Christianity, and freedom are their boast. They were compelled and unhappy posterity to drag on their lives in miserable servitude. Thus, often is the parent's cheek wet for the loss of a child torn by the cruel hand of violence from her aching embrace. Thus often and in vain is the infant sign for the nurturing care of its bereaved parent. And thus do the ties of nature and blood become victims to cherish the vanity and luxury of a fellow mortal. Can this be right? <coughs> Forbid its gracious heaven? Permit again your humble slaves to lay before this honorable assembly some of these grievances which they daily experience and feel. Though fortune hath dealt out out our portions with rugged, rugged hand, yet hath she smiled in the disposal of our persons to those who claim us as their property. Of them as masters, we do not complain, but from what authority they assume the power to, to dispose of our lives, freedom, and property, we would like to know. Is it from the sacred volumes of Christianity? where we believe it not to be found, but here hath the cruel hand of slavery made us incompetent judges, hence knowledge is hidden from our minds? Is it from the volumes of, sl of laws of those also, slaves cannot be judges, but those we are told are found in reason and justice? It cannot be found here. Is it from the volumes of nature no, we can read with others. Here, we can read with others. Knowledge of slavery cannot wholly deprive us. Here, let us, here we know that we ought to be free agents. Here, we feel the dignity of human nature. Here, we feel the passions and desire of men, through check, though checked by the rod of slavery. Here, we feel a just equality. Here, we know that God of nature made us free. Is there authority assumed from custom? So let that custom be abolished, which is not found in nature, reason, nor religion. Should the humanity and the benevolence of this honorable assembly restore to that state of liberty of which we have been so deprived? We, con we conceive that those who are our present masters will not be sufferers of our liberation. As we have most of us spent our whole strength and the prime of our lives in their service. 
and as freedom inspires a noble confidence and gives the mind of emulation to the noblest efforts of enterprise and as justice and humanity are the results of your deliberation, we fondly hope that the eye of pity and the heart of justice be commiserated may commiserate our situation and be put us and put us upon the equality of freedom and give us an opportunity to invincing to our world of our love and freedom by exerting ourselves in her cause and opposing the efforts of tyranny and oppression over the country in which ourselves have long been injuriously slaved. Therefore, your humble slaves must devoutly pray for the sake of injured liberty, for the sake of justice, humanity, and the rights of mankind, for the honor of religion, and by all that is dear that your honors would graciously interpose in our behalf and enact such laws and regulations as you in your wisdom think proper whereby we may regain our liberty and be ranked in the class of free agents and that the name of slave may no longer be heard in a land gloriously and contending for the sweets of freedoms and that your humble slaves as in duty bound will forever pray. I know that was a lot to take in. <laughs> but let us focus on the courage it must have taken for those 20 men to meet in secret to create this petition, let alone take it a step further and present it to the House of Representatives. Mind you, this is 1779. The petition was voted on in April 1780 and resulted in the petitioners being granted a public audience or a current day public hearing and for the petition to be published in the New Hampshire Gazette for three weeks. The petition was revisited in June 1780, but it was effectively put on more time and later forgotten about. After learning this fact and being a city councilor, I have a whole new look on the importance and of the more time items being tracked on our agendas. <laughs> Although slavery remained legal in the state for another 85 years, 10 years after petitioning for their freedom, six of the original petitioners were granted that freedom. Yeah. It wasn't until 2013 when the original petition was uncovered did the governor, did then Governor Hassan posthumously slave the remaining four free the remaining 14 petitioners of the Portsmouth petition. Last summer, Mayor Hansel held a listening session, allowing residents of Keene to share their experiences living and working in Keene as people of color. It was evident that while Keene is a great community, and while not as severe in other communities, we do have problems with race relations. As a result of the listening sessions, the Racial Justice and Community Safety Committee was formed. I was fortunate enough to be on that committee, along with today's performers, daughter, Dr. Dottie Morris and Pierre Morton, amongst others. In fact, this is actually the first time I've gotten, gotten to meet Dr. Morris and Pierre in person. The committee was charged with identifying areas where improvement was needed and with developing recommendations on how to improve race relations throughout the city. In March of this year, these recommendations were presented to the city council. While most of the recommendations will take time to implement, especially if we want to achieve the intended desired outcomes, there are already steps being taken to implement those recommendations. As the mayor noted earlier, additional information can be found on the city website. In closing, I hope we can recognize how much more alike we are than different while celebrating and learning from those same differences. 
let us take a moment to celebrate the recent signing of legislation recognizing Juneteenth as a national holiday. Let this victory invoke new energy and momentum into our continued efforts to, towards equality for all. Lastly, if you're looking for educational and thought-provoking day trips this summer, I would highly recommend day tripping over to Portsmouth to check out the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail. Yeah. There are self-guided tours and organized walking tours. Tours. Uh, good afternoon. Peace to my ancestors and elders. I walk in your strength, legacy, and power today and every day. As an emerging elder, and my last birthday, I think I might have crossed over into being an elder, and future ancestor, I am proud to be here today with you in this space to honor the enslaved people who survived so I could be here today. I remember them as my ancestors, and I can't be any prouder to stand up here today to, to uh, represent their dream and their hope. I often say um, I have to be mindful of uh, suppressing my uh, Southern Black Baptist uh, roots. That's a little different than Southern Baptist. Anyway, that's another story <laughs> for another day. Um, I wish I was down in Nashville to have that conversation uh, uh, with some of the leaders of the Southern Baptist. Uh, but we, that's another story for another day. Um, because uh, I, I come from a, a line of uh, Baptist ministers. So sometimes my cadence and my speech will uh, reflect that. And on times I've been called uh, the Reverend Dr. Dottie Morris. So, so I, 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 and then my grandmother who often um, takes control of my mouth, I will blame her. Um, sometimes uh, she causes me to go off script. Uh, no, I don't need a therapist. Um, these are my ancestors who inspire me and give me the strength every day to do what needed to be done. I often wondered how did they survive, uh, the, first of all, the Middle Passage. If you don't know anything about the Middle Passage, it was a very intense and cruel kind of uh, venture across the Atlantic. Uh, but so many people survived. Uh, some people didn't. Uh, some people said, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, going home to see my God. And he would jump off the side of the boat and commit suicide rather than to be enslaved. Um, but my ancestors went through that passage. They survived that passage. They, I think they already had the realities of me and my sisters and my nieces and my nephews and their children and their children already so etched in their minds that they couldn't see anything else but trying to find a way out of no way, like we used to say in the Baptist church oftentimes, you gotta make a way out of no way. And I think that one of the things that um, a person, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Joseph White used to always say, because he did a book called The Psychology of Blacks, and he says the thing about black folks is we know how to improvise. We know how to change and, and shape because we've always had to do that. And so he said it's even reflected in music. So listen to jazz. You can go to the same jazz concert every night. They can play the same set, but it won't sound the same because they're reacting and responding to their environment. So this whole idea of why did they survive? What did it take for them to do it? I think that it was that kind of spirit. And I can't help but have that spirit in me. I never say die. I never say give up. I'm always saying, well, you know, okay, if they're gonna come at us that way, let's go at it this way. So we always have to have that spirit. I want to, first of all, and, and again, thank my ancestors for giving me that DNA. I wanna thank them over and over and over and over and over again. I also wanna thank many indigenous peoples who provided refuge to enslaved people. 
that was not an uncommon practice for indigenous people to take in uh, enslaved people and uh, allow them to live among them. So I, I can't do anything without thanking uh, the indigenous people as well. I also want to thank uh, the Mexican peoples yes, yes. who fought for and with people who were enslaved for their freedom and their desire to escape from bondage. We often talk about the Underground Railroad heading north to Canada, but for the people of Texas, Canada is a long way, even in a car. So can you imagine at this time people are trying to escape, so they went south. Slavery was outlawed in Mexico. It was against the law. So when slave owners went down to collect their property, guess what happened? The Mexican government and regular everyday Mexicans fought alongside and said, we don't have any enslaved people. We have black citizens, okay? So I would really ask you to, to research that really strong health history. It's being somewhat taught in, uh, in uh, the, the Texas schools. My, my little niece uh, just took uh, Texas history and, and it was some in there, but of course, uh, being the person I am, I said, you need to expand what you were taught. And uh, we're gonna go to a couple museums when I'm there, because I did some research. So she said, yes, Aunt Dottie. <laughs> Today marks an opportunity for us to remember in a country that continues to deny the impact of the past on current realities in order to continue to exploit people, spaces, places, and things, we need to invoke the wisdom of the ancestors to help us connect with who we are in order for us to reconnect with what Tom Porter, a Mohawk spiritual leader says, the original truths. Faced with collective forgetting, we must fight to remember. Remembering becomes an act of resistance when forgetting is the goal. When people were removed from their homeland, this helped them to disconnect and from their memory, kind of torn apart from the land and the connections that were made with that land. This process included disconnecting op oppressed people from their memories of who they were and who they are, and replacing it with the memory of the oppressor. This process creates what is called in a book called uh, something torn and new. This becomes dismemberment, dismemberment. And so telling our stories in settings like this, telling our truths as our grandmothers told us, even if it isn't in a, check, a, a, a history book, it is important, it's a form of resistance to say, you will not suppress who I know that I am, not who you tell me I am. And this memory that we are often planted with, and I'm often heartbroken uh, when there is a lack of pride among people who look like me because it's been beaten out of them. And so I would say that all of us have a responsibility, a responsibility to help with that. And that's part of that is learning some of the history. And I'm telling you, if you are afraid to learn it because it's gonna make you feel, feel guilty, ashamed, and all of those things. Trust me, on the other side is beauty. You have to go through the pain, y'all. Y'all gotta go through the pain. We can't avoid having those conversations. That's the only way to healing in this nation. That's the only way. I don't know any other way to do it. I spent a lot of money to get a PhD in clinical psychology, just to tell you that. It took me 10 years to pay off that thing, just to tell you something I already knew. Okay, so the only way through this, the only way to heal from it, the only way for you to grieve through the guilt, the shame, the pain, whatever you might have for all of us, is we have to go through the pain, y'all. We have to talk to each other. We have to 
do those words that so many of us find so difficult to say, I'm sorry. And what can I do to repair the harm? So language shapes this narrative. And so part of what we have to do is find new words, new ways of connecting with one another. Juneteenth is an American holiday. This is not just about black folks, y'all. Juneteenth, this is the language I want us to start using. Juneteenth is an American holiday. It's not just about one group or another group, it's about all of us. And one day, if you, you don't have any time, I'll tell you about your common ancestor. But that's another lesson for another day. So this connection between liberation and healing that I'm talking about that we need to do, it's under attack. And I'm not being political right now. It's becoming a crime. It has the potential to become a crime for us to do the very thing we need to do to heal. And that's to talk about these things. It's about to, to look at the realities of what happened before us. It's not about blaming anybody. It's about, let's just examine a different narrative. So I can't imagine living in this country where I can't present an alternative narrative to the popular narrative. In order to come up with something that looks like a truth. I just, I, I, I don't know, I'm troubled. It keeps me up at night. I hope it keeps you up too. I need to be up with some other people. <laughs> so this whole idea of remembering the past and understanding the impact that it has on the future, it will create a different, uh, how it has an impact on what's happening now will have an impact on the future. And I don't know about you, but the legacy I want to leave is a beautiful one for all children, regardless of race, class, sexual orientation, gender. The list goes on. I want to leave, don't you? How many of y'all can disagree with me that you don't want to do that? Speak now. Do you not want to do that? Yes. Nobody. That's our point of agreement. We might be thinking about it in a different way, but I think that if we're not able to talk about it, we can't figure out that common ground. So I'm going to leave you with, please, if you want to have a future for all children that's full of joy, or it's as close to joy as it can be, there will always be struggle, but as close to joy as it can be, let's join together. And I think keen, if not keen, where else? If not a town, that sh a city, excuse me, that strives very hard to do what's best, deep in a history of fighting wrongs. All you have to do is look at the, the mural just right there with Dr. Johnson. There are a lot of other wonderful stories about the legacy of King. Let's not let our children down, y'all. And most of all, let us not let down our ancestors and ourselves. Thank you. I keep telling you that there are many sto uh, stories that we have to learn, so make sure you connect with our speakers. And while they are setting up the stage, um, I want to uh, welcome our uh, Keen Public Library Director, Marley Fisk. Uh, she has a couple of things she wants to share. So I had the opposite problem as Pierre has. So I'm going to do the Queen Elizabeth, otherwise, you know, you only see her hat. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm a member of the Human Rights Committee, and uh, Keene Public Library is uh, proud to sponsor uh, Sin, who is going to be doing uh, a kid-friendly Afrobeat music uh, this afternoon. I wanted to invite you all to take part in the discussion that is going to be occurring at the library on Wednesday, July 28th at 1 o'clock. We're going to be discussing the book, Black Friend, 
on being a better white person by Frederick Joseph. This is a um, written from a friend perspective where uh, the author offers uh, candid reflections on his experiences on racism, creating essential reading for those who want to be committed to anti-racists, anti uh, committed to anti-racists and um, who are new to the cause of social justice. This book, along with many others um, written by black authors regarding black uh, experiences, uh, are available at the uh, tent up here for the Keene Public Library Summer Reading Program. It is a program that is for people of all ages, adults as well as children, and you're welcome to choose a book when you sign up um, on, for that program. You do not need to participate in the Summer Reading Program in order to read all these books. They are available at the library, free with your library card, and they, uh, this book will also be distributed as part of that discussion when you sign up for the discussion. I uh, thank you so much for joining us, and um, we appreciate your support. Um, while they'll be uh, setting up the stage, I'm going to do something uh, that is not on the agenda. Uh, and that's how who I am. <laughs> I like to improvise. Uh, but before that, I want to uh, uh, ask all the the people who are uh, on the committee that prepared this event to just come come over. Uh, Councilor Jen, come on. Walkman, Beth. Uh, I didn't see Beth. Uh, Sophia, Dory, and Andy. Yeah. Come over this. Uh, uh, this. That, can we get four volunteers? And we need four volunteers to help us uh, move uh, move the stage. <laughs> okay. So without these people here, this event would not have been uh, a success. So I want just to acknowledge your work and thank you so much. Please. And before they leave, um, the floor is yours. Anybody has a question for them? Anybody? Anybody wants to ask a question? How they make? Uh, how did they decide about the speakers, uh, the program? Anybody wants to ask a question? Oh, you want? To Come on! <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> Dr. Dottie, Dr. Reverend Dottie Morris <laughs> said something so important. It's something that I share with my audience, my community, how important it is to invoke the spirit of our ancestors, to honor the spirits of our ancestors, to thank our ancestors. Let us take a moment to thank our ancestors. And please do something for me. Put your hand over your heart. I want you to remember this. This is your first drum. You carry it with you always. This is a reminder that we are all connected. So I'd like to share my rhythms, my drums, to honor all of our ancestors, to honor all freedom fighters, to honor all of you that are here today. I hope you enjoy my rhythms and my words. I'd like to share with you a poem called Una Peña. Peña is a word that means kind of like boulder, like giant boulder, roca in Espanol and Spanish. But it also means a gathering of like-minded individuals who gather together to be in community with each other. So this poem is called Una Peña. Let us come 
welcome to the meeting place where spirit, flesh, and bone encircle fire, water, and stone, where our bodies are celestial, ocean, stardust, our truest form. Our hearts, our souls, one, our minds, our voices, our own. Un círculo, fuego, agua, piedra. Creamos una peña, olvidamos nuestras penas, and with our eyes aglow with flame, we call our ancestors by name. Palabras sagrados, await the messages. Los mensajes, palabras sagrados. We inhale and fill our lungs. Exhale, whistle and hum. Our ancestral epistles roll off our tongues and become pebble, piedra, peña, montaña, presente, pasado, hoy, mañana, llama, fire, fuego rumbiando, lluvia, ocean. Mar cantando, brisa bailando, viento volando, aire que respiramos, justicia, poder, amor, justice, power, love, the air that we breathe, the air that we breathe. <laughs> Thank you all so much.